Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 30 says this, Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. And so what we see here is God is talking about Israelites that have rejected God, and as a response, God has rejected them. Let's go back a few verses in the chapter to know just exactly what's being talked about here. If you look at ch chapter 6, verse 1, it says, O ye children of Benjamin, gather yourselves to flee out of the midst of Jerusalem, and blow the trumpet into Koah, and set up a sign of fire in Beth Hakarim, for evil appeareth out of the north, and great destruction. And then if we go down, further down into verse 9, it says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, They shall thoroughly glean the remnant of Israel as a vine. Turn back thine hand as a grape gatherer into the baskets. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is a reproach to them. They have no delight in it. Therefore, I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary with holding in. I will pour out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. For even as the husband with wife shall be taken, the age with him that is full of days. So if we see here, the Bible is talking about people to whom the word of the Lord is a reproach. And a reproach is something that you're disgusted with, something that you're just averse to, something you don't want to be around. And so one of the things that we can use to know who is a reprobate and who is not a reprobate is when you read the Bible to them, do they instantly become angry or aggressive or hostile and they don't even want to hear it? And that's what we're going to talk about today, because in several previous messages, I had used the word reprobate or had mentioned them in passing or given a brief description. But this time, what I want to do is give just a full on study on what a reprobate is and how we can tell whether or not we are talking to a reprobate. The word reprobate is used in the Bible about six times, maybe a little more than that, because in 2 Corinthians 13, it's used more than one time, but it's all in the same chapter. But the word reprobate is used about six times in the Bible. And what we're going to do is go through most of those so you can have the general idea of what a reprobate is. Here is the first time it appeared in the Bible in Jeremiah chapter 6, and it defines what it is. It says, reprobate silver shall men call them because the Lord hath rejected them. So we know right off the bat that a reprobate is when the Lord rejects you. And this isn't just, you know, the Lord saying no to a prayer. This is someone who hates God's word, who hates the Bible, and they have rejected God, they rejected Christ, and for this person, God has chosen to reject them in response, and now that person can never be saved. No matter what that person does from here on out, that person is on their way to hell, and we are to stay away from that person. That is what the Bible teaches of a reprobate. So if you look at verse 10, again here in chapter 6 of Jeremiah, it says, the word of the Lord is, a is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. And an example of this was I was trying to witness to a family of Mormons, and Mor the core of Mormon belief is that if you live your life right, you get to become God someday. You get to become your own God with your own planet, and you get to create your own people on that planet. It's a ridiculous belief. And so I showed them from the Bible, Isaiah 43, 10, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. So right there in Isaiah 43, 10, God says, Before me there was no God, and there's not going to be another God after me. And I explained to these Mormons how their belief that they will become gods someday does not square with what the Bible teaches here, that there's not going to be another God after God, and there's never been another God. And as soon as I read that scripture and explained, one of the Mormons got really hostile and said, I don't want to hear what you have to say. You're being mean. You're being a bully. You're just picking on me or whatever. And this has happened more than one time in my encounters with Mormons, that as soon as I read scripture to them, 
they immediately get upset, get uncomfortable, start sweating, and get angry. Now, maybe there are some times when that kind of response is godly sorrow, is being convicted of the word, as Paul teaches about godly sorrow. But if this person's becoming hostile, chances are high that you're dealing with a reprobate, someone whom God has already rejected, and so the word of the Lord is a reproach unto them. They do not want to hear it. It makes them upset. And so that's the first example of a reprobate. But then the question becomes, how, how does a person become a reprobate? Are we just born that way? Are we, are we given a choice whether or not the word of God is a reproach to us? And the answer is yes, we always have a choice. Contrary to what the Calvinist teaches, sin is a choice. We are not born forced into being sinners. And that's why if you look at one of the first times the word sin ever appears in Scripture, it's in the book of Genesis where Cain is considering killing Abel. And look at what God says to him. This is Genesis chapter 4. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, means he got upset, and his countenance fell. And the, word, and the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. So if you notice the kind of language that God used regarding sin from the very beginning, it's a matter of choice. Because he said to Cain, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. Right there, that's indicating that there's an opportunity for Cain to do well and be accepted. Otherwise, if would not even be used in this phrase at all. So that just completely destroys this false teaching out there that people are born on their way to hell, that they're born, you know, with no choice other than to sin. Why did God tell Cain, if thou doest well, if there weren't a possibility for him to do well? So the point being made there is that sin is always a choice. It is a choice whether or not you believe. But once you reject the Lord God, once you reject Christ, there remains no opportunity for you to get saved. At that point, it does not become a choice. At that point, it's no longer a choice. You are bound to sin until you die, and then you will go to hell if you have rejected Christ, and if you have thoroughly in your heart just refused to accept the gospel. And I'm going to go through numerous examples of this happening in Scripture, just so you know that I'm not making this up. This is taught in both the Old and the New Testament. Look at Psalm 81. In Psalm 81, verses 10 going forward, you see this. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. But my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me. So I gave them up unto their own heart's lust, and they walked in their own counsels. Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways. I should have soon subdued their enemies and turned my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord should have submitted themselves unto them, but their time should have endured forever. He should have fed them also with the finest of wheat and with honey out of the rock, should I have satisfied thee. So what we see happening here is that God first extended unto the Israelites the opportunity to get saved and believe on him. This is why it says, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of, Egypt, out of the land of Egypt. And then look at the very last sentence in verse 10. Open thy mouth wide and I will fill it. When he's telling them to open their mouth wide and he will fill it, he's saying, come to me, seek me, ask of me, pray to me, believe in me and I will give you what you need. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. So that's he's giving them the opportunity, just like he gave Cain the opportunity, if thou doest well, should thou not be accepted. 
So you see here that the way that salvation works, or in this case, the way that not being saved works, is that God first extends to us the opportunity to believe in him. And, and that can happen with, you know, the missionary who comes and, you know, meets you and you hear of the gospel and you make the choice whether or not to accept it. Or it could be that you just happen to drive past a church and you're curious and you go in and you hear the gospel. The point is, regardless of how it happens, God gives us the opportunity to hear of the gospel and to choose whether or not we accept or reject it. And in this case, in Psalm 81, we see an example of what happens when they reject it. Because look at the very next verse, verse 11. But my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me. And so what we see happening there is this is what happens when someone has the opportunity to hear and believe on the gospel. They reject it because it says they would not hearken to my voice, and, and it says they would none of me. So not only do they not want to hear the word of God, they don't want anything to do with God whatsoever. So how does God respond to that? Look at verse 12. So I gave them up unto their own heart's lust, and they walked in their own counsels. So he just turned his back on them. He walked away from them. And you may ask, well, how can a God of love turn his back on someone? And you have to understand what love is. Love is a conscious choice. That's why Jesus said, love the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength. Love thy neighbor as thyself. And so if you see how Jesus is defining love, it's a choice because you have to do it with the heart and with the mind. That's the choice making part of the human being. And so when we choose not to do that, when we turn our heart, if we turn our heart and our mind and our soul away from God, then what is God going to do? Come in and force us to love him. He's going to what telepathically brainwash us into loving him. At that point, it's not love because we did not do it with our heart, our soul, and our strength. And because God wants to live in a loving relationship with us, that is why he gives us free will, because love requires choice. You choose to put your faith in God. You choose to love him. And so if God were to brain wipe us into loving him, even though we've rejected him, that's not a loving relationship. And that violates what Jesus taught about love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And so God's not going to force himself somewhere where he is not welcome. And that is why it's so important to make sure that we do not turn our backs on God. As, as believers, of course, we're not going to do that. But to the person who's not yet saved, that's why it's so important for that person to make sure that they don't turn away from God because they will then lose that opportunity to get saved. And then in verse 13, it says this, Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways. I should have subdued their enemies and turned my hand against their adversaries. So you see here that even though these people have become reprobates, God is upset over that. And that just proves how loving a God he is. He didn't just, okay, you turned your back on me. Oh, well, I'm just going to, you know, I don't care. This upsets God because God's perfect plan would have been for that person to repent and to believe in him and to get saved. And that that's what God would have wanted, which is why he expresses regret in it not happening. So let's move on to another example of the word reprobate being used in scripture. Let's go to Romans chapter one, which is the most famous use of the word reprobate. If you look at Romans chapter one, and let's go all the way back to verse 22. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto the corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up into vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which was meat. 
And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do that the things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetous, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that, may, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only to do this, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And that was, that was quite a load there. And let's basically unpack the process that's happening here. Romans 1 is painting a very clear picture of what a reprobate looks like. If you look in verse 21, it says that this person's already chosen to reject God. It says, because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, meaning they had the opportunity to hear the gospel. They had the opportunity to come to God, but they chose not to glorify them. Verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And so this kind of person got stuck in their own ways. They chose not to hear the gospel. They thought that their version of how life is, is lived, their rules were better than God's rules. And look at what happens in verse 24. God also gave them up to uncleanliness. So God gave up on them. Does that sound just like what happened in Psalm 81? Because some people will say, oh, well, that's just Old Testament. No, it's repeated in the New Testament too. The principle is the same. And this is Romans was written even after the ministry of Jesus who preached love and forgiveness. But Jesus only forgives those who want to be forgiven. If you don't, that's why it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. All of these if statements imply that it's choice, but this is what happens when someone makes the wrong choice. And this was written again, even in New Testament time. And changed, verse 23, changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man. What that means there is that they are taking the perfect holiness of God and what they're doing is trying to bring God's glory down to man's level. And you see this even in so-called churches where they will say, oh, because everyone's, you know, professing homosexuality, God must be okay with homosexuality or something like that, where they take corruptible man and they superimpose that on God. What they're really doing is bringing God down to man's level. And that is another sign of a reprobate, someone who is living in sin. And what they do is instead of saying, I'm unholy, my righteousness is a filthy rags. I need to come up and be more like God. What they'll say is, no, you know, God just needs to chill out and come down and be like we are, you know, and that is a sign of a reprobate, someone who takes this incorruptible God and tries to bring him down to man's level, tries to make him like man, just like verse 23 says here, tries to make God chill out and be soft on sin. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanliness, through the lust of their own hearts, and then it goes down in the next few verses to describe several sins that are symptoms of being a reprobate, such as lesbianism, as described in verse 26, such as for men sodomy, as described in verse 27, and idolatry, as described throughout. And then look at verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetous, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers. You see, it goes just on and on and on throughout the next few verses, saying that people who reject God, and it goes on to list pretty much every sin in the book here. But what that teaches us is that once someone's rejected God, once someone's rejected Christ, once someone's rejected the gospel, there's nothing that person won't do. There's nothing that's off limits to that person because God has removed himself God has rejected that person, and so they are liable to commit any of the sins listed here. And the, and the Bible's listing pretty much every sin that can possibly be committed here. And so what we see here taught is that when a person rejects God, there's nothing they won't do. And so you see a lot of people engaged in these just off-the-wall sins, like, you know, these child molesters. You see these murderers. You see these rapists all of these kinds of people, these are symptoms of a person 
who has rejected God. Now there are some people who are living wrong, but who can come to the knowledge of God. They maybe haven't heard the gospel yet, but once they hear it, they get saved, like Paul, for example. But then there are people who have heard the gospel, turn their back on it, and they commit all these sins listed here. And so this is a New Testament teaching of the reprobate. Now let's go to one more example of the word reprobate being used just to get another picture of it, because what we just showed in Romans chapter 1 was the more violent reprobate. You see this person's listed as a hater of God, a backbiter full of murder. This person's violent, this person's prideful. But then you have some people who are reprobates sitting right in church, pretending to be saved, and leading lots of people to hell. Look at, look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, because it's going down a very lengthy list of describing what a reprobate is. 2 Timothy chapter 3 says this, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. And this is starting to sound just like Romans 1. Without natural affection. I think that's a phrase used in Romans 1. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. So you see here, Paul is using the first half of this chapter to set up what a reprobate is. And if you notice, most of the sins listed here are the same ones listed in Romans chapter 1. These are almost parallel with each other. But look at verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. What does it mean to have a form of godliness? It means you appear holy. You talk the talk, but you don't walk the walk. The person sitting in church, but in their private life, you know, they're a murderer, they're a thief, they're a deceiver. This kind of person rejects the gospel. Or this person who says they deny the power thereof, they're teaching a false gospel, such as people who say that Jesus is okay with homosexuality, such as people who pretend to be godly, but say that, oh, creationism is just a myth. They deny the power thereof. They deny the power of God. Oh, God couldn't have done it in six days. He did it in billions of years, like the evolutionist says. You know, or the person teaches, oh, well, the Bible is just a beautiful parable with spiritual meaning. The stuff in it didn't really happen. They deny the power of God. They deny the teachings of Christ because they want to appear godly, but don't want to accept and submit to the power of God. And they just want to believe that any they can preach any and everything and everything goes as long as you're happy. And if you look at, and that's why it says that they love pleasure. Look at verse four. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. They care more about making people happy and being happy themselves than they do submitting to the word of God and being righteous. Now, look at verse 7. Verse 7 paints a very important picture of the reprobate. It says, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, that's really important to pay attention to because I've actually met people like this, and you will meet people like this too, where they will say, I don't believe the gospel is the only way because I'm a lifelong learner. I believe that you, if you stop at Christianity, you haven't learned everything there is to learn. You need to take all the religions together and get a full picture of what God has to say. You can't just stop at one religious book and be content. What does Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father except by me. And so Jesus here in John chapter 14 explicitly teaches he is the only way to heaven. But you have people who don't believe that and they want to say, oh, you know, I can't commit to Jesus because what if this other God is right? We, we just need to keep learning about all the different gods and put them all together and that's a picture of God. Well, that's the kind of person who's ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so if Jesus is the truth, but you want to keep walking in all these other religions, 
what you've really done is you've called Jesus a liar because you're saying that when Jesus claims to be the only way that he's lying, there's really multiple ways to God. And that itself amounts to a rejection of the gospel. So when someone says, I'm a Christian and a Buddhist, I'm a Christian and a Muslim or a Christian and a Hindu or whatever, when they try to say they're a Christian plus and then some other religion, that is just a, a hidden way of rejecting the gospel. That is secret reprobation. Don't be fooled by people like that. The minute someone opens their mouth and says they're Christian and and then something else, you're dealing with a reprobate. You're done. Just walk away from that person. You've got nothing to gain from them. Just don't be involved with that person. Don't even waste your time trying to speak with that person once you find that out. Because the Bible here clearly teaches that those that are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth are reprobates. And we don't want to waste their, our time on reprobates. Jesus speaks of this explicitly in Matthew chapter 13, verse 15. Where he tell, where even he tells, you know, of the reprobate that they have turned their back on God. Look at Matthew thirteen fifteen. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. That's why you shouldn't waste your time trying to explain the gospel to them, because their ears are dull of hearing. They've heard it before and they've ignored it. Look at what Jesus goes on to say. And their eyes have they closed lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and I and should be converted and that I should heal them. Jesus explicitly says they have closed their ears, they have closed their eyes, they don't want to hear the gospel, and he says that they are dull of hearing. And that is precisely why we should not waste our time with reprobates. When it comes to people that are reprobates, there are only two responses that the Bible gives to them. Look at the first response given here. 2 John verses 9 through 11 say this, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. So what we see clearly taught there is that when someone rejects the gospel and they bring a false doctrine, don't even welcome them into your house. Don't even bid them God's speed. Don't bless that person. Basically, in no uncertain terms, the Bible is teaching with regard to the reprobate or the, the false prophet, the person who's bringing the false doctrine, have nothing to do with that person. Don't be involved with that person. Are we to turn a blind eye to their sin and just pretend it's not there? No, because we are also, the second thing we're to do, if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the second thing we are to do is to preach against what that person is doing so that the next person won't fall into their trap and commit that same sin. Look at 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Now let's stop there. That's important. We walk in the flesh, we're physical beings, but we do not war after the flesh. Our fight is not physical. And so, you know, a lot of people will talk about, oh, well, you know, these people are sinners and, you know, they'll get angry and they'll want to hit the person or things like that. No, we are not to violently oppose the sinner. We are not to go around beating sinners up. The Bible says here, we do not war after the flesh. Our fight is spiritual. And so if we want to overcome this person, we need to win the spiritual battle. We need to spread the gospel so that everyone may know that their work is wrong and no one will want anything to do with that person. But we're not to go around beating up sinners, okay? The Bible says we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God toward the pulling down of strongholds. Verse 5 is important. Listen to this casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That is very clearly teaching that our battle is in the imaginations of these people and the thoughts that exalt themselves against God. So you'll have, on the one hand, we're not supposed to violently beat these people up because they're reprobates, but on the other hand, we're not to just turn a blind eye 
and try to be cozy with them or try to just, you know, be nice to them. We're to have nothing to do with them. And on top of that here, we're supposed to cast down every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So the response is simple. Have nothing to do with the reprobate. Don't support them. Even if it's your own family member, you're not supposed to have anything to do with them. Because if you look, Jesus said, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. A man's foes shall be those of his own house. If you look at the scripture teaches. So if someone, even of your own household, is against God, you're not supposed to support that person. Just cast them off, just like God has cast them off, and have nothing to do with them. Yes, that's a hard lesson to swallow, but it's what the Bible teaches. And you are to spend your time preaching against what that person's doing so that the next person can be saved. So if you're out soul winning, if you're out trying to share the gospel like I was, and someone comes to you and they're hostile toward the Bible and they don't want to hear it. And as soon as you read scripture, they don't want to listen. Or you're trying to share the gospel with someone and they're saying, well, I need to keep learning all my life. I need to hear every and anything, you know, Christianity plus this. Don't be discouraged. That person is a reprobate. Just walk away from them. Have nothing to do with them. Do not waste your time on them, but spend your energy preaching against what they are doing so that the next person can be saved. So we just move on so the next person can be saved and we preach to those who will listen. But we're not going to force ourselves, you know, into someone's life who doesn't want to hear the gospel because not even God, who's all powerful and who is holy, forces himself where he is not wanted. We just move on and we just continue to glorify God with the next person. God bless.